Well, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Washington Sports Medicine Institute. Um, this is the third of our lecture series. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's here in person, and it's great to see a nice turnout here, a lot of familiar faces, um, as well as everyone who is uh, attending uh, on Zoom. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lonnie Davis. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I specialize in sports medicine. Um, I'm one of the uh, physicians at the clinic here. Uh, we have a um, pretty broad and um, multidiscipline uh, group of doctors here, and we'll go over some of that as well. But the third uh, of these series um, is a bit fun. Um, forgive my dad jokes. I got kids, so that's kind of how that works. Uh, but this one's O-SNAP, common uh, acute tendon injuries in our aging athletes. Um, so... <coughs> All right, so just a bit about myself. Originally from the Midwest, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. I also grew up in, in Minnesota. Um, I was a three-sport athlete, um, all state in track and field. I did my undergraduate at uh, Cornell University uh, in Ithaca, and where I also did track and field and football. Um, did uh, my medical school at the University of Virginia, and then went on, went, came back to Indiana for my residency. Uh, and then uh, came back to this area for my fellowship at Georgetown in North Shore Orthopedics, um, board certified in orthopedics as well as in sports medicine. Uh, but fun fact about Fort Wayne, I'm sure no one recognizes this guy. This is uh, Fred Zollner, and he's got a bunch of pistons in front of him because he owned a piston foundry in New York, or I'm sorry, in, in Indiana, in Fort Wayne. And he also uh, founded a basketball team there called the Zollner Pistons. They were pretty successful in the early uh, professional basketball leagues, uh, but many may not know that uh, the NBA was actually founded in Fort Wayne uh, when uh, Fred Zollner brokered the deal that led to the NBA, uh, and then he moved his team over to Detroit, and they became the Dr Detroit Pistons. So, so not many folks know that the Pistons are not named after the Motor City, but after uh, Fred Zollner's old uh, uh, piston factory in Fort Wayne, Indiana. All right, raise your hand if you knew that fact. All right, we got a couple uh, basketball historians here. All right, so, um, but also we've started these talks in the past with just sort of defining who we are as a Washington Sports Medicine Institute, and I think it's helpful. I know a lot of folks that may be logged in today may not have attended the prior talks, but um, but we are under the umbrella of Aligned Orthopedic Partners, uh, which now consists of Ortho Bethesda, Washington Orthopedic Sports Medicine Institute, uh, Shady Grove, as well as Jordan Young down in the Norfolk area. Um, and so as we look to set up a, uh, uh, an extension in the Virginia market, uh, we uh, wanted to continue on this, uh, the theme of the Center of Excellence is that uh, Orthopedeza had founded prior uh, with the Washington Joint Institute, uh, the Washington Spine and Scoliosis Institute, uh, as well as the Washington Shoulder Institute. And then uh, now the Washington Sports Medicine Institute. So, so just to um, get some clarity in terms of where, how, what our affiliation is and how we came to be. Um, I also want to just highlight the prior talks. Um, uh, Dr. Gruner gave it and kicked the um, festivities off with his initial talk on innovative uh, non-surgical treatments in orthopedics. Um, Dr. Gruner has been a great addition to our team here and uh, he and I uh, put our heads together regularly, so I really enjoy his, uh, uh, his, um, his, his consult. Um, Dr. Suzanne Walters um, was uh, next up to bat with her talk on adolescent sports injuries and, uh, and uh, super specialization. So both of those talks are available on our website on the, the uh, blog. So if you have time, you can either scan the QR code that's on the screen now uh, or go to WashingtonSportsInstitute.com and you'll be able to access those talks. Those are great talks and very informative. But uh, so the talk today, I pulled the, uh, the honor of speaking on uh, acute uh, tendon injuries uh, in our aging athletes. And, and I will say that, you know, after doing some wind sprints recently, I realized that I might be one of those athletes uh, as I dealt with the hip pain after that. So, um, so it, it is a bit of a, uh, you know, looking into the mirror scenario. So uh, so not to say that this is a support group, but um, I think that a lot of us identify. So the agenda today, we'll talk about demographics and activity. Uh, we'll look at age-related tendon changes. 
Um, we'll look at common acute injuries in the upper extremity. And then Dr. Gruner, who's uh, been gracious to join us today, will we'll, uh, utilize his, his uh, special tool, the ultrasound. I think it'd be helpful to sort of show uh, some, of the, um, some of the power of that and how having access to that in this setting is, uh, really gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, and then we'll go into some common acute injuries in the lower extremity. Uh, and then we'll talk about injury prevention um, as well. So, so the question becomes, what's the aging athlete? Obviously, that's uh, been somewhat of a moving target. We certainly had some guys like LeBron and Tom Brady who've sort of stretched the limits on what uh, uh, athletes can do. So for all intents and purposes, we'll say that folks who are over 40 and still active uh, would qualify. And we can see that we have seen a significant increase in the uh, number of folks over the past uh, couple of decades who are uh, who are fall into that age category, but who remain active. You know, the, the thing that we find, and certainly as orthopedists, the challenge that we have is that, you know, not only are the patients active, but they're also engaged in their activity. They're, it's not that they're going to the gym and using cardio equipment. They're competing and they're still succeeding and they're uh, still driven by their activity. And so uh, with that, it, we recognize that our goal is to facilitate that, to allow them to continue to be active and to be successful. Um, as opposed to historically, uh, these folks are also generally fairly healthy, um, and they also have less chronic disease, which, owns, which uh, leads to, uh, or should I say, which relates to uh, the fact that they have access to folks like myself, Dr. Gruner, and our team, um, also uh, folks in the medical community, whether it's physical therapists, acupuncturists, uh, chiropractors, have all been able to keep uh, folks very active and, and competitive into much longer than than uh, the previous generation. So, uh, so the aging athlete is is uh, is somewhat of a moving target. Um, but we do find that um, despite all of these innovations, uh, there is certainly some wear on the tires, so to speak. And so, uh, the X-ray on the left is one of a normal knee, um, and so uh, that person being active shouldn't uh, present too much of a challenge. But the x-ray on the right is one with advanced knee arthritis, the patient I saw, a 61-year-old who's still competitive in soccer uh, and uh, doesn't complain. Uh, but the, the real question, is it an aging athlete or just tougher folks? So I think there's probably a little bit of both. But when we look at these, it's not just tough, they're fit as well. So this is an interesting diagram, which is looking at uh, our cardiovascular fitness or VO2 max. And we can see that in an active 75-year-old, such as a, the woman on the uh, right of this diagram, uh, their, C, their VO2 max is equivalent to a sedentary teenager. Um, and so we can, you know, we see that not only are folks active, but, uh, but it's something that's objectifiable and it's, it's uh, something that can be P-tracked. So, um, so again, uh, we can see the similar, similar trends in, our, in males as well. So, uh, you know, for instance, a 55-year-old male who's jump roping there is uh, very fit. And, um, and, and we look at VO2 max numbers, very similar to a uh, fit uh, teenager. So, um, so as, we, as we treat athletes, uh, especially as they're aging, we want to, uh, as I said, appreciate not only just their motivation, uh, but, you know, but their, uh, the fact that their level of health is higher and they are able to continue to maintain their fitness. All right, so uh, as individuals age, uh, despite our, um, our, our mental toughness or, um, or what have you, we do know that there is some, there is some impact, right? Uh, we do see some changes, uh, and, and specifically today, we'll talk about some of those changes that impact the, uh, the tendon structure. All right, so just looking at the physiology of this. So uh, I like to think of uh, the tendons are like ropes or uh, cords. Um, and so the, the uh, diagram on the right uh, will show a normal uh, tendon structure um, under an electron microscopy. Um, and then the uh, diagram on the, the uh, right of that is actually uh, an aging tendon. So we do know that there are some changes. Uh, and so we want to be able to acknowledge that uh, and so when we look at the physiologic changes, we can see reduced tendon flexibility. Uh, we know that that, uh, that, does, um, that does put us at risk for uh, muscle uh, tendon injuries. Uh, we see decreased tendon strength. So just the ultimate uh, uh, structural strength of the tendon is decreased as we get older. Uh, we will see a decline in the blood supply. So uh, any activity as we're dealing with biological structures, we'll see accumulation of, of wear and damage over time. And the blood supply or the nutrients allow us to repair that damage. 
uh, having a decrease in that will impact or put us at a higher risk of injury. And then that leads to the tendon degeneration over time. So uh, at our maximum strength, we know that, um, that the tendon is not what it once was. Um, we also see that uh, as we get older, uh, we have moments, periods of uh, uh, disruption or activity level. And so uh, whether it's a, uh, a project at work, a client or what have you, and so, or a child who's temperamental. Uh, so those, those uh, uh, real life events do cause some disruption in our level of activity. And so as we go in and out of our, uh, our activities, we are subjected to increased uh, risk of injury. Uh, we will see objectively a loss of muscle mass and the muscle mass does uh, help to protect us uh, from injury. Uh, chronic health conditions, unfortunately we do uh, uh, pick up some baggage along the way uh, from a health standpoint. And so, uh, some of those things will impact our, our uh, risk of injury. And then medications, uh, things such as uh, statins or cholesterol-lowering medications can affect our tendons, uh, antibiotics, uh, and what have you. So, so there's some, uh, again, some accumulation of damage, as well as some factors that uh, may be somewhat unrelated but tangential uh, that will affect our, uh, our tendon health. So so I wanted to kind of present this in uh, kind of case format in medical schools. We've gone to this problem-based learning uh, format for the most part, and we've seen that it does prepare folks. Or we, uh, most folks will learn uh, more efficiently in that way. So I think it's helpful to kind of present some, some cases or some, uh, these are all sort of fictional cases, but, uh, but I think some of us will kind of identify with these. But so the first one is a 45-year-old right-hand right dominant male accountant who has a one week history of right shoulder pain and weakness um, when after lifting a heavy box onto the upper shelf in his garage. Um, and uh, so then he comes in, he felt a pop and a deep shoulder pain, uh, which was fairly acute. And that's the oh snap, okay. Uh, and so I will say, so my daughter saw this and she knew exactly who this was. I just searched it on the internet, but... Uh, <laughs> Apparently it was from trolls, but uh, she told me that. So, all right. So this guy comes in with uh, seven out of 10 pain uh, with reaching overhead uh, and pain at night. And we do know that uh, the pain at night is kind of a distinguishing factor. Um, I like to say that sleep deprivation is a form of torture for a reason. Uh, we do, uh, even though we, um, we may be mentally strong, we do have to reset our, our batteries. And so the sleep is critical. So oftentimes uh, patients who come in with sleep deprivation have, you know, the issue has been going on for quite a while. Uh, but this person, this is an acute injury for, uh, for tonight's purposes. So this, he comes in with seven out of 10 pain, no history of shoulder pain, but he's, he plays in his adult league basketball uh, on his adult league basketball team. And, and that's important to him. And as I said, that you know, it kind of goes back to the point of uh, that um, it's not that um, uh, often our patients are doing the activity, but they're doing it with some intent, uh, and it means it's it's valuable to them. So so that uh, gives us more motivation to be able to get them back to to activities. All right. So the diagnosis here, uh, we'll call it a traumatic rotator cuff tear. Okay. And when we look at rotator cuff tears, the vast majority of them are going to be attritional, uh, chronic injuries, uh, and this may be a bit of an acute on chronic. Uh, but it's a it's a uh, significant uh, acute loss of function and pain is how we would define that. So uh, just to give some uh, background on the rotator cuff, it's a group of four muscles that helps to support the shoulder um, and uh, it provides stability. It does allow us to put our hand in space. Uh, and so it gives us the freedom of uh, the use of our hand. Um, and you know some will say that the opposable thumb, uh, differentiates us from the primus, but I really think that having a uh, mobile shoulder is really defining for us because it does allow us to put our our our, our hand in space. Um, but when we look at um, rotator cuff injuries, uh, they come in some somewhat all shapes and fashions. But you know, major categories are going to be partial tears versus complete tears. Um, there's you know we look at uh, treating these. Uh, tissue quality is going to uh, be a factor. Uh, age uh, as well as additional injuries. Uh, comorbidities and level of activity is going to be critical. Uh, but then in this sense, we're looking at acute injuries. So, um, so we'll, we'll define the acute um, as the, the real focus here. All right, as the mechanism of injury, in this case, this is lifting a load overhead, uh, but these injuries can happen as a result of falling on an outstretched arm or falling in any, any form or fashion. 
Uh, shoulder dislocations is common that we'll see uh, patients come in with uh, acute rotator cuff tears. Whereas in the younger population, uh, we'll see injury to the ligament structure in the shoulder. Uh, but uh, in our older population, we'll see uh, rotator cuff tear injuries. Um, again, lifting the heavy object overhead or any uh, form or fashion of sports injuries. Um, and the presenting symptoms are generally acute onset of pain, loss of function or weakness. Um, and so that, uh, that's generally how we'll see folks come in. When we look at treating these, uh, to determine uh, which path is, is most appropriate for each patient, in addition to the patient-specific reasons, there's the uh, tear patterns. Uh, uh, and so whether it's tear size, uh, small, medium, large, or massive tears, and then tear characteristics from the standpoint of uh, retraction, uh, tendon quality, and muscle quality. So the, the uh, picture at the top there is an MRI, uh, which shows um, a uh, full thickness rotator cuff tear. The blue arrow is pointing at the tear. Uh, and so we're able to get a sense of uh, the severity of the injury. Um, the two pictures on the right are two uh, contrasting. One is showing the, uh, the actual muscle belly of the rotator cuff, uh, which would indicate a acute injury, whereas the image on the right shows uh, a more chronic uh, scenario where the muscle has been replaced by fatty tissue. And so uh, a patient uh, who comes in with an acute loss of function, once we look at imaging, we'll be able to get a sense of what best treatment options are, and, and we would treat both of these patients differently. So when we look at treatment options, uh, non-surgical management is certainly um, the, uh, is certainly uh, the uh, not uncommon uh, when we're looking at acute injuries in active patients um, who have a uh, full thickness tear, then the non-surgical options tend to be less ideal, but certainly in our partial thickness uh, tear patients. So whether it's activity modifications, uh, physical therapy, doing home exercises, medications, or steroid uh, injections. Uh, but we look at surgical repair uh, in patients who have, a, uh, as I say, complete tears with a significant loss of function. So the, the question becomes who needs surgery and, and how long should we wait or how long can we wait? Um, oftentimes uh, these injuries happen uh, during a, a weekend activity uh, and we show up on a Monday and we say, well, you need a surgery. Well, I have a project or work. And so, um, so life certainly can uh, inter interfere. And so we wanna be able to acknowledge that and, and be able to um, have some, uh, a, a basis for how we approach that. So. So the question of should we repair, um, you know, there's a recent study in 2021 uh, that looked at small tears, and these are uh, uh, would, would be seemingly um, uh, benign tears, less than 10 millimeters. Uh, but what we saw, this was at 12 months, uh, that there was no significant difference in terms of what the patient reported or their outcomes, but we did see a significant increase or worsening of their tear uh, in that nearly one third of them had extension of that tear uh, so they now have medium-sized tears, but also another third were developing uh, signs of fatty degeneration. So, so even though the patients uh, reported that they felt fine or they were comparable, we did see that there was some, de uh, some degradation in terms of the quality of the tissue. And then how long can we wait? So uh, that's also a good question because oftentimes patients will come in and we say, well, the surgery is needed. And the next question is, well, you know, can I put this off until the fall or the winter or what have you? And we want to be able to, to, um, to uh, guide them uh, intelligently. And so uh, we look at um, a study uh, that was done by the Rothman Group uh, a couple of years ago. And this was uh, looked at uh, surgery at less than three months, had the best results. And we saw that folks who had surgery at least within four months had better results. But beyond four months, we did see a deterioration uh, in terms of the outcome uh, of those patients. So, so that helps us to say, uh, we can treat this uh, in a somewhat delayed fashion, but we want to certainly make it urgent. So when we look at treating rotator cuff uh, injuries. Uh, it's generally done arthroscopically. Um, it's certainly not uncommon to have an open procedure, but the, um, for the most part, most have gone to arthroscopic. Um, the picture on the left shows a patient in a seated position, which we call the beach chair. Um, the picture on the right shows a patient on their side during the procedure or lateral decubitus. I tend to choose the lateral decubitus, but um, it's a uh, dealer's choice in that regard. And this is just an uh, a arthroscopic image, which on the left shows the rotator cuff tear, uh, where the muscle has detached from the bone. And we can see that it's displaced uh, some distance. 
we also, um, the bone uh, below it doesn't have a, a significant bleeding response. So really at treating these injuries, there's two aspects of it. There's the, st the stability and the biology. And so um, on the right, you can see this, the cords of the threads, we call them sutures. So that creates a bit of stability, but we also create bleeding into the area to uh, stimulate a biological response. And so, um, so the goal is to allow the tendon to heal fully. Um, and so, uh, but then also protect the patient or while, during that period of time. All right, so and we'll get rotator cuff uh, repair. There's certainly been advances uh, in terms of the actual repair techniques that uh, we use now versus when I was in training. Uh, we've seen advances in terms of the suture material. So we have very high strength suture uh, that uh, has a high strength uh, plastic core. These, we also have collagen sutures that help to stimulate um, healing. Uh, we have biocomposite anchors. In the old days, we used metal anchors. Uh, so the footprint that we leave uh, is less. Um, we have bioinductive implants that we can see on the uh, image on the left. And this is a uh, bovine uh, collagen matrix, which stimulates uh, healing and uh, creates a bit of a scaffold. Um, and we use these in tears that, um, uh, that are either more complicated or if we have poor tissue quality, uh, these can be helpful. Um, on the right, we see a, a, a graft tissue, which is a human dermal graft uh, that can uh, be used in more complex tears as well. So, so we kind of have our, our, our tool bag is uh, pretty, pretty deep at this point. And so we're able to uh, treat each tear individually. Um, and so as we look at outcomes, uh, we know that these will improve outcomes. Um, we look at rotator cuff re rehab. Patients also all, always want to know, well, what does this look like, doc, after the surgery? Uh, and you've gone home, what am I dealing with? Um, generally speaking, most folks are in a brace and that brace may be for four to eight weeks, depending on the complexity of the tear, um, initial home exercises, and, uh, and then a physical therapy regimen, which generally lasts for four to six months. We look at um, return to activity. Um, obviously that's the next question. All right, now we understand what we're gonna do and, and how it's gonna impact me, but when can I really get back to doing the things that I used to do? Um, and so when we look at recovery for small tears, those less than 10 millimeters, generally four months, larger tears can be six to 12 months, and then, you know, and then beyond that for even larger tears. Uh, we do know that that is variable, uh, and for every patient, um, uh, we want to individualize their treatment. All right, I'll pause for questions um, in-house. I don't know if we have uh, anyone on the on the. Uh, online that can submit questions to the chat as well. Yep. You heard the name, I know you mentioned it, the quickest surgery, the best outcome. Because I think most athletes get that, like they get a tear on the field, you know, 72 hours after surgery. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you recommend, like, if somebody gets injured? Get yourself checked out immediately to see if the tear or something like that off the body quickly see if you can say, hey, you can be for the third gone. We don't have that benefit, but yep. you know, jump on it as quick as possible. Yeah, and so the and I'll restate just for the folks online which may not be able to hear uh the question uh here on site, but the question was do we recommend early surgery? Um, and so acknowledging that you know professional athletes are able to they have the advantage, the resources to be able to uh, be treated as quickly as possible. And is there some advantage to doing that? And I would say, yes, there are. And, and, and certainly for rotator cuff injuries, there are certain injuries that, um, that a delay or uh, a period of initial recovery is helpful. Uh, but we do find that uh, for rotator cuff surgeries, we recommend earlier treatment. Uh, and I think that's what some of the studies will show is that patients who are treated sooner uh, have better results. And so, um, and so I, I generally will tell patients that Yes, we you know we can treat any tear, but uh, but smaller tears uh, heal faster, and they are easier to treat. We have better tissue quality. Uh, we generally have to uh, the the extent of the surgery is less, uh, and so yes, we will recommend uh, early treatment. Obviously, with uh, our professional athletes, their occupation is uh, directly relates to their physical health, and so uh, so they tend to have more resources and tend to have. A, a bit more of an incentive to to have their repairs done as quickly as possible, acknowledging that 
uh, that uh, our recreational athletes uh, generally have other uh, factors at play, logistical issues. Uh, but yes, I, I would recommend earlier surgery. Any other questions? Right, what you're saying is perfectly, you know, when there's a problem, how to solve it, but how do we strengthen the muscles around the ball and the abdomen, be it the shoulder or the knee, yeah. you know, so that we... Yeah, so th that's a good question as well, and, you know, and the question in-house was how do we strengthen the muscles, acknowledging the fact that uh, we can, uh, that strengthening is, is protective. Um, you know, I think that it's helpful to uh, to have a uh, sort of a well thought out plan. Uh, one of the things we'll look at later in terms of injury risk is, um, is uh, uh, increasing our level of activity over a shorter period of time. So, so just as the, the, these biological structures, whether it be your tendons, muscles or whatnot, uh, respond well to, uh, to controlled stress like exercise, uh, we do find that they are degenerating over time. And so we do get uh, degenerative changes. So we want to make sure that as we increase our activity, that we match our activity with our, our current um, uh, tolerance for it. So uh, that will increase, that will decrease the risk of injury as we increase the activity over time. And you know, when we look at you know, what is the time frame, we're generally looking at six months increments. So six months, one year, two years to see meaningful uh, tr uh, change uh, in the strength of the tendon or strength overall. So, so we wanna be careful that we don't increase things too, too, uh, too quickly. Other questions? All right, so we'll go to our next scenario. Hopefully everybody's learning from these problem-based uh, <laughs> vignettes. Um, so the next one's a 37 year old male football player. And this one's kind of a fun one, um, maybe for me. <laughs> uh, he's got chronic right shoulder pain uh, with throwing. Uh, he, it's been unresponsive to prior treatment. And he felt a pop deep in his shoulder while throwing. And that was the old snap moment. And I'm sure at this point, everyone recognizes who this is, right? Okay, John Elway. So obviously, he's 37 year old. He does, he kind of falls outside of our our, um, our parameter for an aging athlete, but I would say that the, the years in the NFL probably uh, multiply that uh, age by quite a bit. So, um, so his scenario was a, a chronic uh, shoulder pain, which was relieved um, somewhat acutely, and he was able to continue to play at an elite level and um, won two Super Bowls after that, including a Super Bowl MVP. So the diagnosis for, uh, for Mr. Elway here uh, was a long head biceps tendon rupture. And which is a bit of an acute on chronic scenario. Uh, certainly the mechanism is generally a fall or a, uh, or physical activity throwing or lifting. The biceps tendon is uh, one of the structures in the shoulder joint, uh, as we can see on this diagram. And just like the, the rope next to it, we like to think of it as more of an attritional, but it's, it is a bit of an acute on chronic uh, injury. Uh, and so, but it will cause a, that uh, feeling of a pop Interestingly, in this scenario, most times the pain is relieved. Um, often these patients will have persistent shoulder pain that's been, uh, that uh, uh, has been limiting. Uh, and, and just as in John Elway's scenario, he was able to uh, continue his career. So, uh, so I, I threw this in there not to say uh, it's a uh, common acute injury, but to really highlight the fact that sometimes us as orthopedists, uh, less is more. Uh, and so our, our prerogative, uh, uh, our primary prerogative is to, is to return to the activity. And, and sometimes uh, it doesn't require much intervention from us. Uh, but occasionally we will have patients who have acute uh, biceps tendon injuries uh, who have either a significant loss of function uh, or who continue to have pain. Uh, and so in this scenario, uh, treating that surgically can at times be necessary. Uh, the diagram on the right uh, depicts the, the biceps tendon that's now been moved out of the shoulder uh, and fixed uh, with an anchor similar to what we use for our rotator cuff injuries in the front of the shoulder. Uh, and I like to call it, say that the biceps is now being moved out of harm's way and that uh, the, the point of uh, anchoring in the shoulder is one of convenience, not necessity. And so as we move it into the front of the shoulder, it does bring it out of harm's way uh, in patients who continue to have pain after an acute rupture. So 
Uh, who are the patients? Well, we'll back up in terms of the conservative treatment, as you mentioned, sling, uh, anti-inflammatories, early uh, return to activities uh, and, and potential physical therapy for folks. We look at the surgical repair, it's generally in our higher demand patients uh, or those who are uh, unhappy with the Popeye uh, cosmesis that uh, that's results from that tear. All right, so another uh, vignette, um, this is a 58 year old uh, right hand dominant male ballroom dancer. Any ballroom dancers in the room? I know we have at least one dancer. <laughs> All right, so uh, she knows who, who I'm talking to. All right, so uh, we had acute onset left elbow pain while dancing. Uh, he felt uh, something give way in his elbow while lowering his partner during a rehearsal. And that was his oh snap moment. Um, and so, uh, so he come, came in, uh, he was able to finish the competition because uh, he's tough, right? Um, and, uh, but he continued to have pain and weakness in the arm. Um, and so he presented to the clinic and his, his diagnosis was a, uh, a distal biceps tendon rupture. So we just talked about the biceps at the top of the shoulder. Now we're talking about the biceps at the, the level of the elbow. And so, uh, as we look at the, uh, the biceps tendon at the elbow, uh, we, or should I say at the shoulder, we have two tendons, the long and the short head. Those then um, come coalesce in, at the elbow to form a single tendon unit. Um, and so we look at um, the function of the biceps tendon that's involved in bending our arm as well as what we call supination, which is just to rotate the forearm. And so uh, when we have an injury to that structure, we will see a loss of function in that regard. Um, the diagram shows the blood supply. So as we talked about the uh, loss of blood supply as we're aging, uh, there are certain structures such as the biceps that anatomically have uh, a limited blood supply. So how do these folks present? Well, they generally come in with, as we mentioned, a complaint of a pop or a tearing sensation. Um, and uh, generally this injury happens with a, uh, a sudden load to the arm and an eccentric load, which is, which is to say that um, the biceps is, the elbow is straightening while the uh, biceps is contracting. That causes the increased stress. Um, the, we'll see bruising, uh, pain and weakness, and a possible deformity. Um, when we look at the tear patterns, uh, we will see partial tears um, as well as complete tears. And then this issue of retraction is pretty important in that the biceps tendon is just like this window shape that uh, when, it's, uh, when it does tear, sometimes it does roll up to the top of the arm. And so um, so being able, being aware of that is helpful in terms of uh, treatment options. All right, so, uh, and so when we look at biceps tendons, again, uh, our goal is to uh, differentiate the level of the tear. Um, the MRI uh, on the top right uh, with the red arrow that shows a, uh, a retracted biceps tendon, which is now rolled up into the upper arm. Uh, and then the, the goal is to, to restore that back to its normal attachment. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Gruner's in the house today, and we have a uh, ultrasound, that's the bottom right image. And that's, uh, that shows us the biceps tendon uh, tear using an ultrasound imaging. Um, the, the beauty of the ultrasound imaging, uh, traditionally we would have to send the patients out to have an MRI. Uh, they would have to come back and then we would evaluate that uh, while trying to uh, schedule their procedure. So having, uh, having access to the ultrasound on site allows us to do that at the, at the point of care uh, and to get reliable uh, information and then move forward with uh, determining whether we will uh, look at treatment uh, or what treatment options we'll use. Uh, we look at you know, the MRI, uh, the availability of it can be a challenge at times and it has an increased cost as well. Uh, from an accuracy standpoint, we find you know, most of the studies will show that um, MRI and ultrasound are pretty comparable in terms of their ability to diagnose this. Um, there is certainly some uh, uh, having a skilled ultrasonographer, uh, our musculoskeletal imager in-house helps as well. All right, so we look at distal biceps rupture, uh, we'd say who needs surgery and how long can we wait? Uh, again, similar to the rotator cuff injuries. Um, in terms of the non-surgical candidates, generally uh, lower demand patients, uh, those who are not engaged in lifting or repetitive uh, use of their arm, 
what we do, what we can tell our patients is that they'll use, they'll lose about 50% of their supination strength or their ability to do what this guy is doing in terms of turning a screwdriver. Um, we'll lose some of that uh, endurance as well. And so we'll find that folks will, um, uh, they may have some strength uh, deficit, but they notice it uh, significantly as they're using this, uh, the arm over time for that type of activity. They will lose some of their flexion strength as well as their grip strength. And then uh, again, the cosmetic deformity can be present as well. So when we look at uh, the patients who are candidates for repairs, uh, generally our uh, moderate or high demand patients uh, who uh, are engaged in activities that involve uh, elbow flexion, uh, such as lifting, um, and uh, or they may have an occupational uh, requirement to do these activities. So, so in terms of repairing time, uh, we generally like to uh, to uh, repair these within that two to three week time frame. Um, whereas the uh, differentiating from the rotator cuff, the biceps tendon uh, tends to be much more uh, susceptible to uh, retraction, and so that can be challenging. All right, so there's various techniques that we can use to um, repair the biceps tendon. Um, there is um, sutures or buttons, screws, uh, bone troughs. Um, what we'll find is that um, all these repair techniques are fairly similar in terms of uh, being able to restore the function in the biceps. Uh, and so it is a bit of a, a dealer's choice uh, in terms of what the surgeon feels most comfortable, as well as what the patient uh, feels most comfortable with as well. All right, so, but the goal is to get the shade back down to the bottom of the window. In terms of the uh, return to sport, uh, we'll see that, yeah, the vast majority of these folks will be able to return to their activity. They may have some weakness as we talked about before. Um, the diagram on the right is a little busy, but it, it essentially shows in the blue uh, what their level of activity was prior to the injury. And we can see that it's it's fairly comparable just from a, a bird's eye view of what they were able to do after the procedure. So um, so 93% in this study were able to return to sport uh, and uh, about 65 or two thirds of 65% or two thirds were able to return to their prior injury of activity. And the, the average was six months uh, for them to return to sport. All right, questions. Looks like we're back on video again, all right. <laughs> yes, sir. For the non demand for the procedure, if they come with a lot of negative, what would be the purpose? I don't know what happened to the bottom. What would be the purpose not for them to get surgery? Yeah. Seeing how much of a loss, and then with aging, you got it. Yeah. The ability even greater without surgery. Yeah. I wonder who would choose to. Let themselves actually get worse. Yeah. Yeah. So the question in house was uh, for the the low demand patient, uh, what would be the incentive for them to to choose a surgical option? You know, that that kind of goes to the core of what we do. Um, as you know, you have a patient been in the room. Um, so we want to be able to give this data, and ultimately, patients are able to make their informed decision. Um, there are certainly it can be sometimes difficult to to really uh, quantify. Uh, what may motivate a patient to choose one option or the other. Um, but, uh, and, and also when we, we present data, this is sort of pooled data. So these are uh, large data sets. You know, I think one of the studies was looking at 2000 patients. So in that, in that data set, there's gonna be a, a broad range and it can sometimes be difficult um, to, um, to really kind of dial down to the, the, uh, the differential uh, factors that might impact one person's um, uh, outcome over another. But, you know, that's one of the, you know, the challenges that we, we sit in the room with each patient. And though we pull data, each of those decisions was made individually. And so we try to uh, try to tailor it to each patient's uh, specific uh, uh, goals. All right. I think that was, uh, do you want to try to do your, let's do the ultrasound. All right, so folks, we're going to uh, bring Dr. Gruner in here uh, for a uh, ultrasound demonstration uh, on, and I think we're going to do elbow, Mark, is that what we're going to do? All right, good stuff. So I'm going on that screen, or on the Zoom screen, we plug in here, we'll unplug the presentation, plug that. Sounds like it. Good, Mike. 
testimony. Okay. So one of the things that a patient might come in uh, to the clinic might be for tennis elbow. That is where the tendon, which we call the common extensor tendon, which is responsible for moving your wrist, um, that attaches to the elbow. It doesn't necessarily happen to only tennis athletes. It happens to anyone who's doing excessive gripping, typing, um, activity. Someone coming into the clinic, um, they can get examined, you can get a good history, and we have a good insight for the diagnosis. Instead of getting an MRI, you can then look at the tendon to see if there's a tendon tear or if they have tendonitis. And so what I'll do is I'll uh, talk to the patient, examine them, I'll feel where they're having pain. And that's important because not only am I uh, looking at an image, but I'm trying to correlate where their pain on it. On the, um, on the body correlates to, to what I'm seeing underneath the microscope with the ultrasound. And so if you can see here, um, to the left of the screen, so to the left of the screen is the humerus, uh, which is the elbow. And to the right of the screen is the radius. If I was gonna do an elbow joint injection, I could do it between those two bones and um, if uh, someone had elbow arthritis. But then you can also look at the tendon and you can actually see the entire quality of the tendon and see if there's a tendon there. In addition to seeing if there's a tendon there, you can look at the ligament. So this is in, uh, the radial collateral ligament. So we can see if there's a tendon there or a ligament that's involved and if the ligament is torn, you can check to see if uh, it's unstable by uh, checking their motion and also looking at the elbow. And so this is just a good example of how we can use real time at the point of care ultrasound to look to see if there's a tendon there. Additionally, one of the advantages of ultrasound over an MRI for this is that we can see inflammation. So when a tendon becomes inflamed, um, there's four things that happen. One, the tendon can become thicker. There's different measurements for that. Second, we can look at the bone. And when there, it's been a chronic tendon tear, it takes little bites out of the bone so we can see if it's an acute tear or if it's a chronic tear. Third, we can look at the tendon quality. And the fourth thing is something called neovascularity, meaning that we put this button on here and we can. Uh, pick up little, they're called neovesicles, and that tells us um, if there's any inflammation. So in this situation, he doesn't have any, but in many situations when they have had tendonitis for a period of time, you'll see these neovesicles, which is little blood vessels trying to come heal the area. And so when you look at this under ultrasound, uh, we can diagnose it in the clinic, and if they're a candidate, meaning they've failed conservative treatment for physical therapy for a period of time, uh, we can talk about uh, different treatment options where we can take medicine or devices and address those specific areas where there's intended care or there's information around it. Comment about the What? It's, it's common against uh, anyone who's doing household activities. A lot of people who play tennis. Um, a lot of people who do any activity where they're moving their wrist backwards. Um, and so um, repetitive uh, strain uh, can happen. Uh, it can actually uh, happen to golfers or people who are holding an object. There's on the other side of the elbow, we call that golfer's elbow. But uh, when it happens to the tendon on the back of the wrist, we call that. Tennis album, yeah. I don't know if you guys have the time to show the difference. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a couple more minutes. Yep. Uh, yeah, we can do that quickly. Yeah. Uh, the one, uh, uh, I know, uh, Dr. Davis has a lot of deep things. <laughs> So, you have pain here? 
So he is paying on the outside of his elbow. The next thing I'll do is just see if he, I'll have to move his wrist up and then I'll push against his wrist. Does that cause pain in your elbow? <laughs> and then hold my hold my hand. So this is another thing for kind of double because so it was tended by response. So hold my hold my squeeze this as you right. Does that cause pain in the elbow? Yeah. So when that happens, we think there's tennis double. So I think there's a problem here. Um I, in addition, I can look uh and see what's going on. So He's a good example. So uh, he actually has a small partial tear. So I want you guys to see this. So um, on the screen here, this area, you see how this is all normal and white tendon? And we saw normal and white tendon before. And then you see how the bone, instead of it being nice and smooth, there's like little areas uh, of injury. And then you see this black area. That's a, a very teeny, you know, sometimes this wouldn't even show up on a run, but it's a very teeny, small partial tear of the tendon. So we can see that real time. And um, the other thing that he has is he also has another area that's injured. So we can see that there's another area that's injured uh, right here. And uh, if you see how it's nice and white here, and this is black and white, this is a combination of tendinopathy, and then there might be another injury right here. And so in addition to seeing that injury, we can check to see if he has any inflammation. And look at that. So you can see he has, unlike the other, uh, our normal subject, no inflammation. This is what we consider profound. And look, it's all around this tear. You can see how beautiful you can see the, the quality of the, the, the vessels that are around there that are causing pain right there. So if I was thinking about treatment options for this, he would be a very good uh, candidate for doing PRP or some other orthobiologic treatments directly right where that inflammation and that tear is for the tendon. So this is a very good example of normal versus someone who has an injury and putting together all four signs all in one thing. So thank you very much for that. We're good, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good, that was a good, uh, good case right there for me. Still that exactly. How about you? Yeah, what if we eat collagen? Is it a good preventive for collagen? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, the challenge with that is that, um, you know, just the use of it is quite variable. Uh, and oftentimes it's a, um, it's a, a nutraceutical or, um, uh, not controlled by the FDA. So there can be a lot of a significant variability in terms of what you're actually getting, what the applications, but I would say, if you have any interest in it, I would encourage you to, you know, either bring it into your primary position, or if you have a uh, orthopedist that you see to, to bring that that uh, that question to them directly. So, what you're saying is, um, so in general, you don't recommend. It. Well, I'm saying that the the with a lot of the things that are marketed to patients, direct patient marketing, uh, that aren't controlled by whether it's the FDA or other right. governing body, there can be significant variability in terms of the claims that these uh, that the products are right. making. And the question is, can that uh, be um, supported with, you know, scientific evidence? Yep. That's, um, that was pretty cool stuff. Thank you for Dr. Gruner for doing that. Um, and um, we we're able to show with one of our referring physical therapists uh, <laughs> that uh, who's been working really hard with his patients uh, that uh, the tennis elbow was uh, easily documented on ultrasound. So that was pretty interesting stuff. All right, so we're just going to go now to the lower extremity um, and this uh, do a couple of more case examples. Uh, we did have a, a, a question that came in um, on the chat feed regarding uh, Achilles tendon. And so uh, that is one of the areas that we'll look at. Um, but this first one is a 63 year old female college professor uh, who has an acute onset of leg pain uh, while water skiing. Um, she felt a pop uh, tearing sensation in her buttock area. Uh, after she caught the toe of her ski. 
so again, that was her oh snap moment. Um, and so um, she presented with pain and bruising at the back of the thigh. Um, and so that's a characteristic uh, injury pattern. And her injury was, um, was a proximal hamstring avulsion injury. And so when we look at this, the proximal hamstring is another area that's commonly uh, injured. I actually just saw a 61 year old in my office today who had an injury while sprinting. Um, but this is an area where we will develop an acute on chronic uh, injury as a result of a excessive load to the hamstring area. And, and classically this happened with our water skiers where we had a, a straight knee or an extended knee and flexion at the hip, uh, which then loaded the, uh, the hamstring. Um, characteristically, folks will come in with significant bruising on the back of the leg owing to the, uh, the vascularity in the hamstring area. Um, and so the, uh, the picture of the MRI on the right is one of an acute hamstring avulsion. The brighter white area is the amount of swelling or bruising in the area. And so we can we get a sense that this causes a pretty significant trauma. Uh, and there, you know, there is a lot of debate whether these injuries need to be repaired. Oftentimes, uh, historically, they weren't repaired uh, and the acute symptoms would settle down. But if we uh, test folks subjectively, we find that they are functionally limited or they've, um, uh, they've uh, voluntarily limited themselves. So, uh, but when we look at non-surgical management, we generally limit uh, to single tendon uh, injuries or tendon injuries with less than uh, two centimeters of retraction. Um, these patients are treated with physical therapy and a gradual return to their activities over a period of four to six weeks. But then the more significant injuries, whether it's greater retraction, that being over two centimeters, or involving all three tendons of the uh, proximal hamstring, then those are generally uh, treated surgically. Uh, the image that you see is a brace that will often use to limit their, uh, their hip range of motion. But when we look at treating these, uh, it's generally done through an open procedure. Uh, we look at return to sport in these folks. Um, in one study, recent study, a uh, pretty large study, I'm sorry, a meta-analysis of uh, studies looked at uh, the mean age in patients was 41 years old, and uh, the majority of the folks were able to return to sport at around six months, uh, at, uh, and about two-thirds were able to get back to their previous level of activity. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's critical to, uh, again, recognize uh, that uh, these injuries, these acute injuries do happen in our aging athletes, and um, this is uh, the historical perspective of uh, this being a career-ending uh, injury uh, is uh, something that I think is, um, is certainly um, is in the past, and we really want to treat these patients uh, aggressively, knowing that, uh, that they, their goal is to get back to their activity uh, and not just um, uh, to, to perform, but to perform at their pre-injury level. All right, so our last case scenario for the evening is a 61-year-old female retired nurse um, and everyone can probably see the image in the background, which is pickleball, right? And so, um, so there's been some recent reports about um, the, uh, the number of injuries that have occurred uh, with the pickleball fad. Uh, but um, uh, this, uh, she experienced acute uh, right calf pain two days ago while playing pickleball. She describes an episode where she was pushing off and um, she felt as, uh, as if someone had kicked her in her calf. Um, and so that was her, her oh snap moment. Um, and so she was unable to continue playing uh, and uh, now unable to bear weight due to pain and weakness in her leg. Uh, and I'm sure everyone knows the diagnosis here. Um, she uh, had an Achilles tendon rupture. So we know that this is the most common uh, tendon injury in the lower extremity uh, and has been increasing in incidence. Um, the injury is generally a sudden um, acceleration, deceleration moment, uh, and will generally feel a pop in the leg. And most folks uh, present with the sensation that they were kicked or hit in behind, uh, and everyone turns around to find out who caused their Achilles injury, and there's generally no one there. Or if there is someone there, they get a, uh, a, a glare. Uh, but, um, but we've looked at treatment options. Generally, um, non-surgical is an option. Um, we looked at functional bracing, and that's the boot that we see there. And we know that uh, with the more uh, modern uh, treatment options for non-surgical treatment, uh, we've uh, seen that the 
uh, the outcomes have, uh, have uh, started to uh, equal the surgical treatment options. So but when we look at surgical treatment in active patients, uh, we uh, talk about open versus percutaneous. There's, these are just different techniques. The open procedure re re uh, is more traditional. It requires a bit more of an incision, as we can see on the diagram there. Um, the goal, just like the other tendon injuries, is to re uh, recapitulate the anatomy uh, to restore the attachment of the tendon. Um, and so uh, we know that the open procedure has kind of been the gold standard for this. We look at um, the two options that we'll see uh, currently with uh, Achilles tendon, that being open or percutaneous. There are pros and cons of either option. Uh, the open tends to have a higher risk of wound complications, which is still relatively low. And we'll see that higher in some of our patient populations, that being diabetics or, uh, or smokers. Uh, and the percutaneous has a higher risk of nerve injuries. Uh, return to sport in our Achilles tendon ruptures is generally. Um, at about six to 12 months, uh, and um, the rate of return is about 80%. I'll pause for any other questions at this point. All right, so when we look at uh, injury prevention, um, there are some certain factors that can reduce the injury prevention. Um, and so uh, we look at uh, regular physical ex exercise, as we mentioned, uh, having disruption or interruption in our physical activity can certainly put us at risk for injury. Uh, proper warm-up, which sounds like your coaches from high school or, uh, or rec leagues that used to uh, harp on that, but proper warm-up certainly is uh, critical. Uh, gradually increasing our level of activity so that we don't have a significant increase, uh, and it allows our, uh, our uh, biology, our body to adapt to the, uh, to the changing stress. And then uh, good old fashioned listening to our body. Uh, if it hurts, uh, it's likely uh, that uh, we, may be, uh, we may be challenging our body and putting ourselves at increased risk of injury. Uh, maintaining a, a balanced diet and um, which can help to support overall health as we talked about in terms of blood, the blood supply and nutrition to the, uh, to the tendons. And uh, when in doubt, uh, seeking medical attention or medical advice from folks like myself, Dr. Gruner, or the team here uh, is very important in terms of avoiding uh, injuries and complications. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, that's my team. They get to put up with all my dad jokes on a regular basis. You guys just get them for one night. So appreciate it.